So the title of the, the sermon today comes from our last hymn, uh, which is Break Not the Circle, and that we ultimately hope to see eye to eye with laughter and elation. And it struck me this morning as I was running around at the last minute uh, again, um, <laughs> trying to get ready for the service, uh, that I often held myself uh, sort of with a grudge. I mean, I have a grudge against myself for, for, for being late, for being last minute Tony. And um, so I was walking down the hall back to the office because I, I actually was up here ready to start, but I didn't, I didn't have my sermon with me. <laughs> so I had to laugh. Uh, I had to laugh at myself, which is an important part of the puzzle of life. And that's the laughter part. The, the uh, elation is that I am, am actually elated to be standing here ready, uh, finally, <laughs> to deliver this. A couple of weeks ago, while Rabbi Herman was here entertaining you from this pulpit, I was up in the Boston area attending my 50th high school reunion. It was a lot of fun, and it was great to catch up with a lot of old and even older friends, it seems. One of my earliest childhood friends was organizing the event and knowing I was a minister, asked if I might say a few words uh, at the beginning of the evening about those classmates who had died since graduation. Ours was a class of well over 500. Uh, so you can imagine that we've lost a good number of folks along the way, starting with a traffic accident the summer after our graduation that took three of our classmates. And so it was that before the reunion, I took some time uh, to look in our yearbook at the photos of each person who had passed, trying to remember them in some setting, in a classroom or in the hallways, on the sports fields or in a musical program. But as you can imagine, with such a class, a big class, it, it, was, it was impossible. There were just faces there that I could not place in my own memory. Nonetheless, when it came time, I spoke about how each of us individually and all of us collectively are the keepers of our classmates' living legacy. And that when visiting the memorial room that had been set up and standing together in a corner, we might share a story of a classmate that we missed that maybe someone didn't know quite as well to keep that legacy alive. In the spur of the moment, I also suggested that if anyone had been holding a grudge against another classmate for 50 years, it might be a good time to have a laugh and talk about it. So you can imagine my surprise when a little while later, a fellow uh, member of the high school band came up to me with a smile on his face and told me that he'd held a long time grudge against uh, three of us who made up the first trumpet section in the band. Jim had never quite uh, made it to first trumpet, and it had really bothered him. He was an excellent trumpet player, very good mechanically. And while he knew that we didn't make the decisions about who sat where, uh, it was towards us that he held this grudge. And he told me that he had used that frustration, that feeling, as a motivation to work hard at his music, and ended up enjoying a wonderful career as a music teacher, and he still taught trumpet and still played in a pickup jazz band. I knew for a fact that none of the first trumpet players, because I'd talked to them earlier, had stayed with the trumpet more than a few years after high school. So I told him he'd surpassed all of us uh, pretty quickly, and I hoped he still wasn't hanging on to that grudge, since it was now me that envied him for his having the craft both as a vocation and an avocation. So we had a good laugh about it and uh, caught up after a long time. I met his wife and, and uh, got to know about his family. And while I don't really think he held that grudge for 50 years, he, he clearly did remember carrying that load around for a while. And it did cause me to reflect on how easy it, us, it is for us human beings to hold on to those times when we felt hurt or slighted, while at the same time we seem to have a 
marvelous uh, mental mechanism for pushing the times when we might have treated someone else less than lovingly or skillfully somewhere into the recesses of our memories. As Unitarian Universalists, we have moved far enough, far enough away from our Jewish and Christian roots in any form of liturgical calendar so that we're not provided with a regular time, whether weekly, annually, or even every 50 years, to uh, think about uh, our trespasses and consider those who have trespassed against us. But as we're uh, taking a closer look this year at world religions, it's interesting to note that every one of the world religions deals with the important notion of returning to right relation in some way of repentance, of forgiveness, of atonement. On Tuesday night, here in this room, our friends from the Naples Jewish community will join Jewish people from around the world to begin the observance of Yom Kippur. This 25-hour period of fasting and prayer comes at the end of a 10-day period of reflection known as the Days of Awe that started a week ago with Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur is the moment in Jewish time when people dedicate their minds, their bodies, and their souls to reconciliation with their fellow human beings, with themselves, and with God, committing to self-reflection and inner change. As both seekers and givers of pardon, Jewish people are urged first to turn to those whom they have wronged, acknowledging their deeds and the pain they've caused, and having asked for forgiveness, Jews are also commanded to forgive, to be willing to let go of any resentment they feel towards those who have wronged them. And it's only when these two things have been accomplished that an individual can turn to God and ask God for forgiveness for their sins. The other Abrahamic traditions also have specific times when the focus is on self-denial, repentance, and atonement. And while each tradition is slightly different, has a different religious focus, each offers a time during the calendar for communal fasting, ritual, and prayer. For Muslims, the month-long observance of Ramadan, which is the annual celebration commemorating the first revelation of the Quran to Muhammad, is a time when fasting and prayer are meant to spur deep reflection and the effort to bring oneself into alignment with Allah and thus the, be the best we can be. Here, too, the emphasis on communal life in prayer and breaking the daily fast. And while there are no specific calls for adherents to consider how they may have wronged someone else and seek forgiveness, there is, as within Judaism, the call for repentance, describing a returning, a returning to God in the straight path. Christianity has a many-layered and regulated path to atonement, not the leech of which is the Catholic sacrament of confession and penance. But the season of Lent leading up to Good Friday and Easter, when considered in its proper context, is much more analogous to the Jewish month of Elul, which precedes the High Holy Days. Martin Connell at St. John University writes that the 40 days of Lent is the supreme time of the church year for repentance, reconciliation, and return. Lent counters individualism with the communalism of the church society and with its annual span during which members of the local church consider their failures in individual lives and the church body as a whole considers its life. Ultimately, however, each of these traditions, in each of these traditions, repentance, forgiveness, and atonement rely on an understanding that the final cleansing of sinfulness is not a matter for any person or institution. It is reserved for the one God who will judge both the individual and the community. The Hindu and the Buddhist traditions both draw from ancient Sanskrit writings known as the Vedas, which teach the spiritual path. And while forgiveness is not a major topic in these texts, it is held as an important virtue in the great mythic texts, the Ramayayan and the Mahabharata, which includes the Bhagavad Gita. The Mahabharata even has a famous hymn to forgiveness, which states, forgiveness is virtue, forgiveness is sacrifice, Forgiveness is the Vedas. Forgiveness is Brahma. Forgiveness is truth. Forgiveness is holiness. And by forgiveness is it that the universe is held together. 
people who've practiced the many strands of what we call collectively as Hinduism have a number of religious pathways towards reconciliation, including pilgrimage and bathing in sacred waters, and personal devotions such as chanting God's name at uh, home shrines or at a temple. And there is also the timeless sense of karma, that a person's actions will continue to have an impact both on self and others through many lifetimes, and that fully reconciling the oneness of the God within and the universal God, Brahma, is the ultimate goal uh, of self-purification. Buddhists who find out that, who find they are not in right relation have only to return to the eightfold path taught by the Buddha, right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi, the way of meditation. In many ways, the path for Unitarian Universalists is much the same. We are asked to reflect and consider our transgressions and those ways in which we have been hurt uh, and hurt others, and resolve to return to right relations through our own efforts, our own path at reconnecting. And since we are people of action, and now is as good a time as any, let me suggest that you make yourself comfortable, or as comfortable as our chairs will allow. <laughs> Take a deep breath and open your hearts and minds. In a minute, I'm going to offer you some time to sit in silence and reflect on your life and community in our lives. But let me, let me begin by centering us with this, these words from uh, Jay Abernathy, who, a former minister of this congregation. We Unitarian Universalists also have some wonderful writings. Jay writes, all our lives we have been told to seek that which is good, to turn our faces from the dark and toward the light, toward beauty, toward truth. But the truth is that the world is not always good. The light we seek casts shadows, and there is brokenness amid the beauty. Our world is far from perfect, and so are we. We strive to be in right relations with one another, but there are times when we are left angry or disappointed, even as we sometimes anger or disappoint others. Whether it is harsh words said by a loved one, the loss of friendship, the carelessness of a stranger, or the scars left by childhood trauma, bad things do happen. We cannot seek truth, beauty, and light without acknowledging and affirming that which is false, broken, and in shadow. For all of these exist within us as well. In this moment of silence, let us remember the wrongs we have endured the imperfections we have perpetuated, that we may forgive them and ourselves and forgive yet again. So let's take a moment and consider the times when we have been less than skillful in our dealings with those with whom we are close, in our interactions with people we call friends and acquaintances, or how we hold the wider world. A moment of reflection. Let's take another minute to consider what's happening now in our lives, what's coming up from the mundane to the anticipated moments, and think about how we might 
bring our best selves, our best skills to bear on our time ahead individually and together? How is it that we might transform ourselves, our relationships, and the world in the year ahead? The Reverend Rob Eller Isaacs, a Unitarian Universalist minister from the Jewish tradition, writes a wonderful litany of atonement. And I ask that you share it now. It's a call and response. Your words are, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that we have struck out in anger without just cause, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For the selfishness which sets us apart and alone, we forgive ourselves and each other. We for losing sight of our unity, we forgive ourselves and each other again. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which we have fueled, which have fueled the illusion of separateness, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. As Unitarian Universalists, as members of a modern, free, and liberal church, we don't have a universal understanding of a God or spirit or power that lies beyond our understanding. In fact, many in this room would eschew the idea of such an entity. Neither do we have a common creed to which we look to judge and measure our lives. Our commitment to right relations is taken more from an ethical perspective and from our tradition of covenanting with one another to walk together in the spirit of love and understanding, to meet together with laughter and elation. All we have, all we need is to enter into a covenant by which we as a community promise to walk gently with each other in the spirit of love and the occasional gentle reminder that we are not perfect and we can't do this alone, but that through thoughtful reflection and intentional living, we can always return to right relation with our fellow travelers on a journey of this one lifetime. So may it be.